Learn from people who lived it is supported by the woman-owned Advanced Systems Integration. ASI is an audio-visual integrator with offices in Minnesota and Arizona. If you're the IT director or on the IT staff and you need to build out collaboration systems or sound masking, they can help. And they pay special attention to that last 5%, which is often the most trying but important. Video walls, surveillance cameras, meeting spaces, and so much more. We've got a link to ASI in our show description, or you can go there yourself at asi-av.com to see their gallery of work. When you're going through it, it's so important to put your thoughts out into the universe. And I mean either saying them, articulating your thoughts to people, communicating them with real words, or writing them down. And if you're into writing over talking, then I want to suggest not a diary. It's a really cool product by a dude named Sam. Listen to this. So what I've launched is a product called Not a Diary. And what it is, is it's an SMS based journaling software that sends you a journal entry in the form of a text message straight to your phone every single day. Plans start at just a couple of bucks a month and you'll be surprised at how good you feel by just getting it out. I think Not a Diary helps the most because kids don't want to carry around another journal. Uh, they don't want to download another app where there's a hundred different action items inside that app that they have to navigate through. They want it to be super simple. Get connected and find out more. We've got a special link in our show description for Not A Diary. Well, hi, it's Matthew. Before we get into today's episode with Sue, I just wanted to pop on quick and say thanks again for, you know, hitting the like button downloading an episode, listening to us. I'm so grateful. I didn't walk away from my radio career for no reason. I believe in this movement, and I think with your help, we can really make a difference. I encourage you to share these episodes with people that you think need to hear them. And today's is one that a lot of people, unfortunately, need. Due to COVID and whatever else, many people have experienced death over the last couple of years. And that is one of those things that if you've never been through it before can be one of the most incredible teachers in your life. Sue and I, who you're about to hear from, have something in common. And it's an awful thing to have in common. It's watching somebody come off life support. I'm gonna warn you, the episode you're getting ready to hear is a little graphic in nature, but I believe it's also very healing all in the same breath. I hope the poem she reads at the end puts you in an unbelievable space. Finally, the woman that you hear introduce every episode of Learn From People Who Lived It is Sue. So I'm going to take her job and she's going to be interviewed on today's episode. Welcome to another episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. My name is Sue and I'm 66. What story are you here to share? I'm going to talk about my journey through my insecurity, my mother's death, for which I felt responsible, and how I learned self-care and how to love myself. Who do you hope hears this? There's so many people out there who need it, but if just one person hears it and it makes it better for them, that's enough. Yeah, I've never met our next guest, but I feel so oddly connected to her. Maybe it's the fact that we had a very similar experience. I don't know, maybe we met in another lifetime. Um, You are the ultimate caregiver, and she joins us from her home in Arizona. Hi, Sue. Hi. It's uh, great to have you on our podcast. Troy's alongside us. Troy, good afternoon to you. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Sue. Hi, Troy. So uh, you know me. I love just getting to it. Uh, Let's let's talk a little bit about your journey, Sue. That's why we're here. Uh, You mentioned on the onset some insecurities, some stuff with your mom, and we'll get to all that in a little bit. But I really think it's, it's important to understand the first 10 years of people's lives. Who is Sue from zero to 10? Oh, Lord. Um, Now we're going back a ways. Um, Well, I was a very, very painfully shy child. I was very, very thin, funnily enough, (laughs) which changed later on. Uh, I went to stage school for my first school and did, um, uh, you know, advertisements, things on the TV and stuff. But I was always terribly shy and I never felt like I fitted in, frankly. I went to a private school and they were all rich and my parents weren't. So I always felt like an outsider, frankly. What was your home life like with your mom, dad, brothers and sisters? What's that dynamic? Um, Well, my mom was wonderful in her own way. I adore my mom, always have done. Um, My father, he loved me dearly, but um, he wasn't tactile. He wasn't touchy touchy. And as a kid, I always remember running up to him when he came in and it was like, no, no, let me take my coat off. Let me do that, which always hurt me. I think now I look back on it. Yeah, that's Um, an interesting thing to just just pause on really quick, Troy. And I almost want to come to you right out of the gate about that comment. What can that do to a little person? 
When I think about when I think about that, I think about the meaning that we make, how it feels, and then the meaning that we make about that, mm -hmm. and then we the meaning we make and the decision we make about that. And a lot of times that can really cause us to question our own self worth and our own lovability. And when we experience those types of events over a long period of our life, we begin to question whether or not we are lovable. And then we yeah. begin to make question. We, we, we begin to make decisions about that, that fear of whether or not we are lovable. Does some of that ring true? Oh, yeah. Like I say, at the time when you're a kid, you don't get it. You don't nope. understand it. And you and like always as a child, you blame yourself. It's something you've done. Um, and I think that's when you start building walls. You mentioned to me in our interview that you've been married a few times. Uh -huh. And so uh, but the story that got my attention was when you left one of these gentlemen to go take care of your parents. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Where are we chronologically in that order? Oh, that was that was like my last husband. That was back in 2003. So what's going on? Well, basically, my, my mother and father retired um, to Arizona. My father was born originally in Pennsylvania and they met in the war. And when it came to retirement, mother thought it would be a good idea for father to come back to America. I don't think he cared, frankly. Um, but they ended up in Arizona. Well, as time went on, um, unfortunately, he got dementia, which turned into Alzheimer's. And I'd visit, but she'd always write letters. And it got to the stage where I'm reading between the lines. And she was, you know, at the end of her tether. Father was now in a home. And I could tell that she really needed me more than my husband at the time. Bless him. Um, we weren't getting on too well. So I basically packed four suitcases and flew out to live with my mom and help her. How long did you get to spend with your dad before he passed away? Well, I got out here in October 2003, and he died in June 2004. Okay. So it wasn't long. And when I visited him, in, you know, I, I saw him in the home. I went with my mom. Um, it wasn't my dad. Um, I was the only one who could cut his nails and cut his hair, even though he still screamed a lot, which is a weird thing to do. But I used to go, and he had no idea who either of us were. And he didn't know who my mother was. And, you know, when he died, they'd been married almost 60 years so it was it was the strangest thing, but he could get aggressive. Like I say, stupid things like cutting fingernails and hair. He used to get really aggressive about and lash out. And I could actually do it, but he still used to complain. So I had an idea maybe somewhere in there he knew who I was. But most of the time he just sat there not having a clue what was going on. Um, every now and again, I used to look at him and I could see abject terror in his eyes. And I just used to wonder what it was, what memory he was reliving. I wondered if it was the war or something. I just don't know. But it really used to make me feel very uncomfortable and upset. How strange is it to be in a room with your dad and he doesn't know who you are? It's, it's I, I, you know, how do you explain it? It is, it, it's painful. It, it, it's really hurtful. You sort of want to feel like you want to shake them and say, I'm here, it's me. It's, and you can't do that. And there's just this blank look. And... He got to the stage where you could say, do you want something to drink? You might get an answer, but you couldn't say, do you want tea or coffee? Because there was no way he could make a single decision at all. It's horrendous. I mean, Lord knows what it was like for dear mother. I mean, she was stoic, but I know it hurt her badly. And the only reason she put him in the home was because he was too big for her to handle. My mother was like five foot four and 90 pound drip wet. What's your relationship like with your dad and death? As we got older, I got wiser. Um, me and my dad were so much alike, temper-wise and stuff. We used to fight like cat and dog. Mm. Um, but I know that he would have walked over hot coals, killed anyone for me. You know, he did love me. He just didn't have a way of showing it so much. He wasn't, like I say, touchy-feely, whatever. But towards the end, before he'd really lost the plot, yes, we did hug and... I, I didn't get my university degree until I was 40 and they flew over from America and he was starting to lose the plot at that point, but he was so proud. I have photographs of him sitting there when I was getting my diploma and he's just grinning from ear to ear. So mm. I know he remembered that. And then, so he eventually loses his battle with dementia and Alzheimer's yeah. and... What, what next? Where are you? Because you've, you've just divorced somebody to come and take care of these guys. <laughs> that and I so, did online. Yeah. Well, where are you personally in this whole thing as as your dad's dying and you're taking care of your mom? What's happening to just Sue? 
Um, well, I think that's where my caregiving began. You know, I, I'm trying to be strong and stoic because my mother always was. I mean, I remember her burying my grandparents when they died and stuff, and she never shed a tear. But I could see her crumbling when this happened. Um, so I'm just the one that's, I suppose, yeah, like I say, stoic, nonchalant. There, there wasn't a lot of emotion coming from me. I just did my best to hold it all together. And we had to plan for my father's funeral because he's in Arlington. Um, and that's a difficult thing to do. And a lot of that time was spent up with paperwork and stuff because Arlington is the government and the military and there's form after form after form after form. So that mm -hmm. took up a lot of that. Um, once that was over and we'd had the funeral, and may I say, they do an amazing job. You would think the military would be cold and hard. No, they were so kind to my mother. It was it was amazing. Um, and then my brother went back home and we just sort of settled down. Um, I was working and we were, like I said to you before, we were almost like sisters. We just used to do everything together. When you left to take care of your, your parents and you were you were married at that time? Yeah. How long did you leave to be to be with your parents while you were still married? No, um, I left and never went home. Oh, you left and never went home. I left in 2003 because I said to my husband, I said, you know, at the time, I because like I say, we were starting to fall apart at that point. Uh, and I said to him, mother needs me more than you do. I just packed my suitcases and went, I left the house. I left everything. I didn't take anything with me. I just left. And right. we, we still talked on the phone. We sort of stayed friends-ish, you know. Um, we're still on Facebook now. We're much better friends. Um, but we actually got divorced online. <laughs> Okay. I, I almost want to take this opportunity to remind everybody something that I learned on my retreat, Troy, which is that we're all the elephant tied to the chair, right? We're all the elephant tied to the plastic chair. And I think Sue's almost a perfect example of that. Mm. You know, she mm. felt really drawn to be with her mom and her dad, but she's in a marriage that quite frankly, she says, isn't going right. And almost all of us would choose to, oh, I got to stick it in. I got to fight and I got to work this thing. But you felt the tug and you just said, okay. Here's the keys. I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of cool when you think about it like that, because it's a reminder that in almost every circumstance, we have a choice. It may not be very easy. It may be difficult. It may even take a few months to sort out, but we have a choice. And I picked up on that and thought it should be kind of applauded. So there it is. So I want to talk about you and your mom now, because that gets us a little closer to the mm -hmm. real heart of where things you know, kind of start to feel different, you know, inside of you. Um, so how long do you and your mom, AKA your sister, uh, have together? We had nine years, but like I say, mother's uh, health started to decline one way and another. So we ended up, I was always at the doctors with her. Well, then she ended up, she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because she had a lump on her arm. And when they'd removed it and that, it came back as that. So then we had to go in for... Uh, what they called a mugger scan, which is basically they have to look at her heart because they needed to put a port right into her heart so she could have her chemotherapy. Because if they plugged it into her arm, it would have killed her arm, which is mm. very scary when you have to go through that. I can imagine. So we used to have to go for chemotherapy. I think it was about every six weeks or so. Um, we used to sit there. We did lots and lots of crosswords. Um, and she'd sit there and take her chemo. And I remember they said that, you know, you're going to lose your hair, this, that, and the other. So mother had bought some wigs and things. And they said it would be in, I don't know, three or four weeks. It did take longer. But I remember I was brushing her hair. And one day it was like, Houston, we have a problem. I moved the brush and all the hair came with it. Uh -huh. And she just looked at me. So she said, right, cut it all off. So I got the clippers out and we cut it all off. But the chemo took such a toll on her. Um, she would, you know, like the next day she'd wake up and then she'd have to have prednisone and stuff. And that was the evil thing. But they said she had to take it. And she just had no energy, no nothing. The light in her eyes had just about gone out. It was so scary. You know, she just used to lie around looking like, a, you know, half dead. It was it was horrendous. And the real strain is me trying to be happy and saying, it's fine. We're going to be great. You know, right. and that is so hard. Did you and your mom ever get to a stage where you kind of felt like what you were putting in her body to try to fight this thing was worse than what it would be if you just, I don't know what the word is, but let it play out? 
Yeah, that's that's the funniest thing because I remember when we'd gone to the oncologist and we'd seen her and she went through this and said we'd have to have all this chemotherapy, blah, blah, blah. And when we got home, I said to my mother and I looked her dead straight in the eye and I said, if you don't want to go through this, I said, that's fine. This is your decision. And she nearly tore my throat out. She goes, of course I'm going to go through it. you know. And she just, yeah. and she was yeah. a fighter, absolute fighter. And she said, no, I'm going to, I said, fine. I said, I'll support you either way. I said, but I didn't want you going through all of this because you thought you were doing something for me. Mm. I, I would have been crushed if she said I didn't want it, but I would have supported her and, and done whatever I'd had to do because that was, you know, I'm her daughter and that's what I should do. I just love that you guys had that conversation. That really is so important for people because you didn't leave anything on the table. You know how she felt. She knew how you felt. That was the thing. And so how long does it take from, you know, losing the hair to losing her life? Um, well, she survived the chemo. Eventually, she came out the other side of that, believe it or not, grew her hair back. We, we kept it super short. Um, and I don't know if you know anything about chemo, but when you go through, like she did CHOP, basically it destroys every single fast-growing cell in your body. So it destroys your complete digestive tract as well, which, you know, never really comes back. So eating was a problem. So I used to cook and do stuff. But then she had um, a stroke, and they think it was a heart attack. They're not sure and stuff. And she collapsed and we went off back to the hospital. Um, but she came out of that slowly but surely. And we went and we did the, the skywalk. I have pictures of us doing that. Um, and she got quite a bit better. She got to the stage where she could still walk a bit and she still drove the car a little. Um, and she wasn't who she used to be. She was you know, but I mean, she was getting on in her eight. She was at 89 when she died. Mm. So but she was a remarkable woman. And like I say, she was OK. Um, we, you know, went all over the place because I told you yesterday we that where she died was when we went to visit relatives in Pennsylvania, my dad's relatives. And she had a fall. And she'd hit her head really badly. And I had to argue with her to take her to the hospital. That was when um, she had a brain bleed. And they took her down and then she came back and she seemed like she was going to be good. And when they were taking the drains out, she had another brain bleed. And it turned out she had about four surgeries in a week. And I remember them saying to me, normally we wouldn't have done all this, but your mother was still fighting. It was a very interesting thing that even then she was still fighting. And on the last surgery she had, they brought her back and one of her pupils was completely blown. One of her hands was all clawed up, you, you know, and... I knew she wasn't there like her. They taken out half her skull and like her head was caving in. It was just horrendous. Mm. And eventually, um, like you say, you talk to the doctors, the doctors won't commit one way or the other. But that night I was talking to the nurses because she's on the respirator and they have to clean her up and stuff. And they basically told me what I already knew that, you know, she was never going to come back ever. Um, yeah, this is a really tough place to be. And I, I think this is maybe why we connect Sue. Uh, because when my father passed away of uh, the heart attack, they got him back for a little bit and then put him on the ventilator and the life support thing. And we kept him alive for a couple of days and ultimately had to make the decision that you had to make. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's let's go into the scary place right now. Sure. You have to decide what you're going to do with your mom's life. Yeah. Well, I told them that morning, I said, you know, I, I want to turn the machines off. Um, basically, I said, because this, this isn't doing anybody any good. And um, my cousins, I had two of my cousins come over um, and we went in, you know, bless them. And, and you, you watch the movies and stuff and they turn the switch and everybody just peaceably fades away. And you and I, Matthew, both know that's not what happened. And they took the ventilator out from my mother and she spent the next five hours gasping for breath and it was heart-wrenching it was awful um you know it was like well they've given her morphine can't you give her any more well no it'll kill her well you know <laughs> you sit there and you go and so what you know oh but we legally can't do it so we had to sit there and watch her gasp for breath for five hours in the end i i convinced them to turn the monitors back on so i could watch her heart and stuff because you you couldn't tell like which was going to be the last breath it was just awful it's one thing to make the decision it's another thing to watch them yep. leave the earth and and my dad was very similar to yours it took us took several hours for him to finally give it up 
Yeah. And it is un- oh my God, there's just not even a there's no word for it. It's so violent and it's yeah. and it's scary. And sometimes you feel like they're there and they're gonna come back. And then other yeah. times it's like, okay, we're done. And then boom, there's a big breath. And and it really is, and I'm being this descriptive so that people understand the magnitude of the moment. Oh, yeah. It, it, it just tears the heart right out of your chest. It, it's absolutely dreadful. And, you, you know, it's you can't explain it to anybody else. You just can't. And this is this is what basically happened. And in the end, like I say, we sat there and I was watching the monitors and you could finally see everything was decreasing and stuff. And I told you that it was Guinness that always kept her alive. It was the only thing that she had when she had her... Um, chemotherapy and stuff I always used to get her a can of Guinness and she had one every day from when she started chemo for the rest of her life basically because it just seemed to pick her up so I'd said to the nurses and stuff can I give her some Guinness and they said well she won't be able to drink it I said fine I got a cup and I put some in and one of those popsicle sponge things that they swab your mouth out with and I put it in her mouth and I climbed up on the bed with her and I put my arms around her and I said to her um, I didn't tell you this, but I whispered in her ear, it's okay, you can go. And within a couple of minutes, she had gone. Mm. And that was the hard, one of the hardest things I did because I'd whispered the same to my dad in hospice. I told him he could go, I'd look after my mother, and he passed that night. So you'd go through all of the things after this because everybody gets, yeah. you, you go through the funeral, and then there's this, there's, there's that, there's tying up all the loose ends. Um, yeah. When do you start to notice, Sue, that this is affecting you mentally and spiritually? Well, dear, dearest mother, she's in Arlington with father. Um, so like I say, that was another thing. Like you say, the funeral, like you have to go through all the, the stuff. And I actually had her buried on my birthday the following year and all the family came. But it was really from the moment um, I left Pennsylvania because she died on the Wednesday and I flew home on the Sunday night, I think it was. Um, I, I, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, God, I've killed my mother. I killed my mother. She might she might have made it. I, I killed my mother. And it's apart from the fact I'm in her place and she's not there. Um, it was it was horrendous. And I was in a spiral for, I don't know, two or three weeks. And I was working for the post office at that point, and they provide counselors. So I thought, well, I'll go see a counselor. And I don't know who this counselor was, but she just made me feel worse because every time I used to tell her about what happened, she'd sit there crying. And one day I was at home sitting there in front of the computer, just lost, not knowing what the heck to do. And into my head popped, well, your grandmother was a spiritualist. And I always remembered this from a kid. So you Google it like you do. And um, up came a spiritualist church just down the road from me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I might as well go. And I did. And I went for a couple of weeks and I spoke to um, one of the pastors there and they do like mini readings and things. And I thought, well, why not try it? So I did. And I spoke to this lady. Bless her. She's dead now. But she was a lovely lady. And she said, okay, what do you want to know? And I said, I want to know about my mother. And she said, well, when did your mother die? And I said, about four or five weeks ago. And she said to me, oh, no, she said, it'll be far too soon. You know, I can't tell you that. And all I can say is her complete demeanor changed. And she sat bolt upright like my mother did. And she looked me in the eye and she kept trying to say a word and she's going saucy, sauce, whatever. And I looked at her and I went, I used to call my mother silly sausage. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, that's it. And she said, she's here and she's fine. And she says, thank you for what you did. And in that moment, so much of that weight left me. It was just unbelievable. And I just, it was like, wow. When do the four agreements come into your life? Because you and I talked about that a little. Yeah. Funny enough, that came from church. I used to do um, spiritual healing. I can still do it now. I mean, I don't have to be part of the church, but I found I could do that and I could channel it. And it's something that's just amazing. Um, but we used to have sort of like classes and stuff and we talk about different subjects. And then one of them came in with the book, The Four Agreements. And we started going through that. And then I, you know, I was reading this thing and it's, 
Well, I think everybody in the whole world needs to read this book. So number one, just so you guys know, if you haven't read it before, number one is be impeccable with your word. Number yep. two is don't take anything personally. Yep. Number three is don't make assumptions. And number four, Sue, is what? Always do your best. There it is. And the Always real funny thing about that is I told you um, when we spoke the other day that I went to T.O.T. Wakam um, on a retreat with them. And there was Don Miguel Ruiz, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. and uh, Jose Ruiz. And we were going through the four agreements and stuff. And I remember Don Miguel saying, but be careful with the fourth agreement. Don't beat yourself up with it. Don't say, you know, I didn't do my, I'm not doing well enough. And he said, so he added that little codicil, which I thought was really good because I, you can actually, you know, beat yourself up with, I'm, I'm not doing enough. So I want to know, when did you finally decide to forgive yourself for your mom's situation? Well, like I say, the the reading was the, was the main thing. That was the really big one that took it off my shoulders. You still have little creepy thoughts every now and again. Um, but I was good with that. But like I said to you yesterday, when I, I wasn't a person that really liked being alone and I was living on my own and I sat down one day thinking about, well, you know, I don't have a lot of friends. I don't have this. I wonder why. And I came to the conclusion I did all the things – I hated other people doing. I was judging everybody, but I was still doing it myself at church. And that basically with the spiritualism thing, there's no like one per se God. It's like the universe. You're all part of the universe. You're all connected. And if you're hurting somebody else, you're hurting yourself. And I believe that wholeheartedly now. And I sat down and I had a lot of soul searching and meditation. And it's like, you need to change this judging thing. You've got to stop judging everybody else. And you've got to learn to forgive yourself and love yourself or you can't be a functional, loving person to anybody else. And, I, you know, I, I just sat there and went through it in my head. And like I say, with the help of things like the four agreements, like, you know, be impeccable with your word, because your words can be poison or they can be magic. It depends which you want it to be. So think before you open your mouth and say something nasty, because... You just don't know how it affects people. People make offhand comments and don't think about it. And I had that done to me and I'd go home and I'd cry because it hurt. Troy, I want to ask you a little bit about what you tell folks in and around death, you know, because I'm assuming people are listening to this podcast are connected with the title of it and understand what happened. And so maybe they're fresh off the wound, right? Maybe, maybe a loved one is just lost, <clears throat> uh, has just been lost in their life. And um, boy, Sue and I know the struggle real well. I'm sure you do too, Troy. But what do you what do you teach people in these moments? How can we be helpful? You know, we're helping them to work through grief. Oftentimes, just means holding the space and yep. and not having their answers for them. Um, you know, being gentle with them and giving them the space and asking them questions. Oftentimes, about their deceased loved one, um, knowing that that deceased the loved one is near them is always around them. Um, it's just the veil that disconnects us, that allows us not or, or, or really prohibits us from seeing them. But they are there. And they are all around us. And we hear reports of this all the time. Yeah. And we hear stories of butterflies and <laughs> hummingbirds and, and, and balloons and the assurance that that our loved ones really do never leave us. Mm -hmm. um, and they're always with us. So it really is not about providing any answers for anyone. It's letting them come to their own answers and hopefully finding that forgiveness in, in, in Sue's case and the forgiveness of, of, of letting her mother go and um, the gift that it is. Um, and, you know, death doesn't have to be painful and it doesn't have to be hard. Um, and just being with that person in that process of dying, allowing them that, that grace to transition easily from one world to the next um, is a real gift and and walking people to the other side um, as Sue has done is and, and Matt Matthew you've done um, are blessings that we receive um, you know the people that are left here receive I've I've done a lot of volunteer work in hospice mm -hmm. and um, you know sitting next to the the dying um, I'm not sure who gets the greater gift, the one who's volunteering or the one who's passing, because it's an honor and a blessing knowing what life they had um, and being able to share in that and to walk them uh, to the other side. 
Um, totally. I can just say that you probably felt this way too, Sue. Um, I'm, I'm glad I was there. <laughs> as, as awful as that is, I'm glad I was there. I got to see it all myself. I got yeah. to do everything I knew how to do. I got to try everything I knew how to try. I got to hold his hand as he took his last breath. Uh, there's no questions for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And and that is that took a long time to get to that space, right? Yeah. But that's that's where I'm at right now. And I couldn't agree more with what Troy was saying. I'm getting kind of emotional talking about it. But I think <laughs> one of the greatest things that we can really do is hold somebody's hand when they cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I uh, oh, I'm just sitting here with prayer hands. I just love it so much that mm -hmm. you got to do that for them. Yeah. And one of the other things that helped me, which it, it sounds awful, but it helped me was in January. Um, I just moved into my new house and I was having trouble with the plumbing and the phone goes. So I picked the phone up, not thinking about it. And it's one of my really dear friends. And she also knew my mother phoning me to tell me her son had been killed on his motorbike. Mm. And it was like, oh, my God. And I just dropped everything. And I went over there with her and even though I was still raw, the little bit I'd learned, I found I could help. And like Troy says, the thing about holding space, there's no platitude. You don't go, oh, well, you know, maybe he's in a better place stuff. That's the worst thing you can ever do. Um, it's just being there and whatever it is they need or want or, you know, you don't judge because everybody grieves differently. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my favorite things I ever saw, um, there's a Facebook page, I think it's Grief Unspoken. And basically what they said was, Grieving is like an ocean and the waves come in. Sometimes they lap in and then sometimes they crash down on top of you. And even now I can have a day where it really hits me about mother and I will sit and I will cry. And I think, okay, fine. And I'll have a 15, 20 minute cry. I go wash my face and carry on with my life. It's what happens. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. And the thing I also learned with my friend when her son had died was that once the funeral and everything's all over and I found this, everybody like disappears, you know, they're all around you and then they go away. And when they met her, they avoid the subject of her son. And I always talked about her son because I knew Stephen and I'd said to her one day, I said, Stephen said something to me and I, you know, I swear it did. And I gave her the message. And what hurts parents who lose their children is people not talking about it because it makes them feel like their children didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it's scary. And it's like, mother, I never stop talking about her. I'm always talking about her because she did exist. She was a huge part of my life. Yeah. So, you know, I can't just push it away and say it didn't happen. So how did you how did you come to forgiveness? How did you come to forgiving yourself? Um, like I say, I said, well, it was like, you know, we've said before, you, you need to look after yourself. In the end, you're. You're on a downward spiral <clears throat> and you can only go so low. Once you hit bottom, you have to stop. And I can say, I did. I hit bottom and then I got the message and everything else. And then you start climbing back up. And the, like I said, the blessing was I was told that what I did was right. And I knew it was right. And I could feel mother around me. And there was just little things, you know, things would get moved. Stuff would happen. I mean, she was 89. She had a, she had a pretty good life. You know, it's like. Yeah, it's my time now, and I just have to, you know, get on with it. And if I don't, like you say, forgive yourself, basically you're, you're just no use to anybody, and we're here to help each other. Uh, that's why we were made, isn't it? I'm curious now, Sue, how do you honor your mother and the way you live? Well, like I say, I never stop talking about her. I have her pictures everywhere. Um, I talk to her a lot. <laughs> yeah. I talked to my dad too because my dad was really good at DIY and stuff and I did a lot of remodeling and things in my mom's uh, condo and that and I used to say when I was doing yes father yes I know how you would do it but I'm doing it this way <laughs> <laughs> so how did you make that switch because earlier when we were talking you were talking about stoicism and the stoic posture uh -huh. <laughs> That's the British upper lip, darling. <laughs> <That's the British. laughs> so to go from to go from the place of being stoic to a place that allows your feelings and your 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 sadness or even in joy um, to allow that those tears to come up mm -hmm. and to allow those to come out. That's not very stoic, Sue. No, 
well, by then, you see, mother was gone. I was on my own. I could do what the heck I liked. Because <laughs> I say, I ended up on my own. I had my own house. It was just me, you know, yeah. so I, I could do what I liked for the longest time. Um, when yeah. I went out, when I was working, oh, yeah, you know, we, we had the face back on. But eventually uh, I learned that that wasn't the thing because I wasn't me. And I don't know. I think people know when you're not being you and you're being fake and they're uncomfortable about it too. You know, I don't think any less of you if you don't like me or the way I am. That's that's entirely fair. There's there's people that walk in the room and their energy comes in and they follow and it's like, ooh, yes, okay, I don't think I like you. I'm not going to be nasty to them. I'm not going to be rude. I'm not going to hurt them. But I'm not going to be their best bud either mm. because their energy, whatever it is, is not good for me. So I just move away from it. I can't say I don't judge people now. I do. But I catch myself as soon as I do it and I can wind it back and say, now, breathe. No, you don't know their situation. Mm. And it's not near as often as it was. But having spent all that time insecure and being judged, uh, you, you lash out and judge back. And it's not the thing. It's this nasty, vicious, evil circle we all get into. All right. As we wrap up, Sue is going to give us an enormous gift today. This is a poem that really helped her after her mother's death. It's written by Henry Scott Holland, and it goes like this. Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I have only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I, and you are you, and the old life that we lived so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we are to each other, that we still are. Call me by the old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always used. Put no deference in your tone. Wear no false air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes that we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without an effort, without a ghost of a shadow upon it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is absolutely an unbroken continuity. What is this death but a negligible accident? Why should I be out of mind because I'm out of sight? I am but waiting for you, for the interval, somewhere very near, just around the corner. All is well. I still get the chills every time I hear Sue read that. Thank you so much. All right. A couple of more episodes coming around next week. We're going to sit down with Stephanie. Was known for like punching holes in doors. And it was just, it was very bad. I was a very yeah. angry person myself. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Learn From People Who Lived It. A reminder again that ASI or Advanced Systems Integration designs and installs cutting edge audio and visual equipment. This woman owned small business is big enough to find an AV solution for your next boardroom, classroom, council chambers, or courtroom. Bring in ASI and two decades of AV experience. Visit ASI dash av.com to see their gallery of work when you're going through it it's so important to put your thoughts out into the universe and i mean either saying them articulating your thoughts to people communicating them with real words or writing them down and if you're into writing over talking then i want to suggest not a diary it's a really cool product by a dude named sam listen to this so what i've launched is a product called not a diary and what it is is it's an sms based journaling software that sends you a journal entry in the form of a text message straight to your phone every single day. Plans start at just a couple of bucks a month and you'll be surprised at how good you feel by just getting it out. I think Not A Diary helps the most because kids don't wanna carry around another journal. Uh, they don't wanna download another app where there's a hundred different action items inside that app that they have to navigate through. They want it to be super simple. Get connected and find out more. We've got a special link in our show description for Not A Diary.